Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate wickedly smart women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome a very special guest, Julie Waters. Julie is the author of HR Explained, a practical guide for human resources for small business. A human resources HR professional for over 20 years with a special interest in sharing her knowledge and experience with anyone who needs it. Julie's career has been built with experiences from employers in Virginia, Massachusetts, Florida, and Washington through a wide range of HR positions. Waters holds a BA in English from the University of Washington and an MS in Human Resources Management from Troy University. And she is also a certified professional in human resources. (laughs) So I'm so excited to have you here today, Julie. Welcome to the show. Hi, Angel. Thank you so much for having me. It's super great to be here. Oh, well, you know, one of the things I definitely want to celebrate immediately is Julie was a listener and now she's a guest. How cool is that? I'm so glad that you are here. So I want to ask you first, Julie, were you the, the kiddo that was like organizing all the other kids and making sure everybody was okay? Or was this something that came through later in your journey? I think it came through later in my journey. I I was not, I was kind of bouncy and dancy and flighty as a child. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm the younger sibling, so <laughs> I could get away with it. I think my interest in human resources and kind of organizational development came from me being nosy, I've discovered. It it served me well in my HR practice, being able to have a connection with the the staff members that I'm working with. So I, I know things about them because I sit and chat with them. So it makes it easier when there is something bigger to talk about. Ah, beautiful. Okay. So one of the things that I'm curious about, Julie, is for those listeners who aren't on the inside of HR, mm-hmm. what are some things about that career path that you think might be of service, especially for somebody who may be at the beginning of their career journey or potentially, you know, pivoting into something else? Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to be a lawyer when I was younger and then decided there's no way I wanted to go to law school. (laughs) So (laughs) this career path did give me the opportunity to dabble in the law because a lot of my expertise and human resources professionals across the board have a very niche expertise in not just employment law, but benefits law and paid leave and all that kind of stuff that can get an organization into trouble if they don't know what they're doing. So as a new person in the career, you know, this in in human resources careers or in an organization in general, there's a lot to unpack in there, whether it's benefit specialists, including leave and time off, the laws that surround, whether it's maternity leave or me- other kinds of medical leave. There's also teaching, you know, training and development. There's also kind of the traditional black hat, nobody likes HR position of discipline terminations, that sort of things. There's also hiring. So you also get to be there on somebody's really good day when they got a a cool new job. So it kind of runs the gamut. And in smaller organizations, you get to do all of those things. In the Mm. big ones, maybe you can specialize a little more. Beautiful. So the kind of next question for me, and, and you know, as I'm tuning into our listeners around the world who might have a small business, is there a like 
stage at which point you probably better get an HR specialist on board. And if so, like, is it a dollar amount stage? Is it a number of employees stage? Mm-hmm. Can you share why somebody would want to bring on an HR specialist? Well, thank you for that, because some of that is spelled out in my pretty book, HR Explained. <laughs> Even an entrepreneur or a small business owner that doesn't even have any employees, but maybe they look, they want some in the future, they want to be able to grow, or someone who on the occasion has to hire an independent contractor, they do need some pretty basic human resources information, including what's the difference between an, an independent contractor and an employee, which can get you in pretty big trouble tax wise and fines and fees that go that go with making those kinds of mistakes. So really the answer is zero employees. There are some laws that kick into place when you have 15. Hmm. That doesn't mean those laws don't apply to you on a kind of individual level with, you know, four employees or nine employees. But when you get to 15, that's when like systemic things need to be looked at. And that's when the equal opportunity people need to look at it. Mm. If you're having a bunch of, a bunch of say terminations of people of a certain race or gender or something like that. So Mm. yeah, really the short answer is all of them. And, but you don't need a person, but you just need the tiniest bit of knowledge. Which we can find in your book, which is awesome. (laughs) Well, I want to, I want to just share a personal story when I, you know, back before I got into the online space and was working with people all over the world, I did have a little sticks and bricks art gallery for a period of time after I left the real estate industry. Nice. And in my little sticks and bricks art gallery, like I was paying everything. <laughs> and I had people who were interested in playing with me. They were interested, in, they wanted to like put their own courses in there. They wanted to like sell their stuff. They mm-hmm. wanted to do, you know, readings and things like that. And then it came clear to me, I reached a point in the journey where it was like, it's a giant hemorrhage. This is a giant hemorrhage and I've got to stop the hemorrhage. (laughs) And I went in one day and I said, here's the deal. I I cannot pay you guys anymore. I was paying them all 1099s because Mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was saying you have to work this time and this time. It was like if they showed up and manned the, you know, front desk, I'd give them some money. So that I could be at home with my kid. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, I told them we're done. If you want to keep playing with me, it's I'm not paying you anymore. It's volunteer. You come in if you want. Don't if you want, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they all stayed. They didn't like they didn't hear me when I fired them. (laughs) (laughs) And a week later, when it was check time, they were like, what do you mean you're not paying me? Mm -hmm. So. I can definitely see. And that was like four people. I had four people. I can definitely see where, because they also ended up taking me to court, which was not fun. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Right. Right. So where do business, small business owners get in hot water? Mm -hmm. And like, are there like interim HR people? Is that that a thing? Like where it's a part-time thing? Can you help us know a little bit more about that in this in between zero to 15 space? Mm -hmm. There are there are HR consultants, like something that I can do for somebody. There's people like me all over the country. There are local chapters of human resources organizations that you can contact for something like that. There are also some larger organizations that you as a small business would say, pay a retainer to, and then have access to the expertise that are on that staff. As a third option, there's what's called a PEO, a professional employee organization. And it is otherwise known as employee leasing, Mm -hmm. where the employee leasing company does all the back, the back end stuff, payroll benefits, handbooks, some recruiting, all the firing, if you need that. The employees work for, you know, Joe's auto body, but also work for Julie's PEO. It also, it can help the small business owner in terms of offering better benefits and frequently has better labor and industries or workers comp rates as well. So there is a financial, they 
usually take a piece of payroll to pay themselves. You're not writing a check to them every month for their services. They just take a a little bit of payroll off the top. So particularly if you have a lot of turnover, it can be to your advantage to have someone within a phone call, whether it is a PEO or an organization like that, or just your consultant. The short answer I would have said to you is you can't volunteer for a position that you would normally get paid for. So like if I work for a a museum even, Mm -hmm. if there are employees that get paid to sit at the front desk and take tickets, I cannot have someone volunteer to sit and take tickets because Mm -hmm. that's a paid position. So, and that's a lot of companies will say, oh, well, can you just stay and maybe do this other we're having an event for my organization. Can you come and schmooze at the event? But that's a company that pays you. So you need to pay them for that time. So. Yeah. So in my case, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was, and you know, obviously it wasn't because I ended up in court, but my thinking was I, when I told them we were done, I was like, we're done. Mm-hmm. You can leave today. <laughs> But they were also benefiting because they were like doing readings and, yeah, you know, their, doing their products. They were doing they were providing their services and getting paid for their services from the people. Anyway, it mm-hmm. yeah, it turned into a, a lesson for me, which, you know, <laughs> we have these lessons. So and now if, you're this ama- amazing communicator. So yeah, <laughs> of course. And I yeah. So when we come back, I'm going to take a short break. But when we come back, I do want to talk about because I have done a lot of different business models myself. And I mm-hmm. do want to talk a little bit about like distinguishing between the 1099 and the employee and, sure. you know, the things that we need to be paying attention to both federally as well as in individual states. But right now we're going to take a quick break. Wickedly Smart Women, we could use your help. If you are enjoying the show, please consider joining our community, making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com and sharing with your lovely lady friends that might benefit from our content. Help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I'm very excited and want to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We are now up to 108 countries, so we are welcoming, and we're also welcoming thousands of downloads from all over the world. I want to shout out to this week to our brand new country. It's listed on our thing as two countries, Antigua and Barbuda, but it's like counted as one. I don't understand that, but they also put Puerto Rico on there and that's not a country. So we're, we're taking it and we're celebrating those people who are in Antigua and Barbuda listening to us. And we also want to say thank you to our listeners in Argentina and Aruba. And we will be right back with Julie Waters. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by Women in Transition, Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your wealthy life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Julie Waters. Before we went to the break, Julie was talking about her book. And so I want to let you all know where you can get that book. You can go to hrexplainedbook.com, hrexplainedbook.com. And we'll have that obviously for you in the show notes. And you can also connect with her on social. All of her social links are on that page as well. 
So before we went to the break, Julie, we were talking a little bit about my my little sob story from back in <laughs> 2007 when they took me to court. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> no, that's so bad. I'm so sorry yeah. that happened. <laughs> well, it was a lesson learned. And I do want to talk about, because I think I was paying them 1099 also because They were like booking things for them. The money Mm -hmm. would come through the store and then I would pass it through to them. I don't know. Anyway, can you talk about, especially for our listeners who are in small businesses, Mm -hmm. who often stop themselves from growing because they are concerned about having employees. Yes. Like, can we talk about the difference between an employee and a 1099 and what are some of the pitfalls and what are some of the benefits of both? Sure. The example I can fall back on because everybody, almost everybody drives a car or knows about cars. So I have a garage and I work on cars And now there's these new electric cars and I don't have expertise in that. So I hire someone who very specifically for when I get the autos in that I don't know how to work on, I hire this person to come in. They bring their special electric car tools and their special computer that they plug in and all that stuff. And I pay them for that day for that car. And then you know, six months, 12 months, however long later, it turns out I'm getting electric cars all over the place and I need this individual to come and be there all the time. That's where it switches from being an independent contractor or a 1099 employee to an em- an, a W-2 employee. The advantage to the individual is if I'm that electric car mechanic, I can set my hours. I can say no to jobs. I can I do use my own equipment. And if I am an, a W-2 employee, I'm working typically with equipment that belongs to the shop or the company. They set my hours. They bring me my car for the day because it's the customer that walked in the door. At the beginning there, that's that's the 1099. That's the independent contractor. Later, when you hire them on, there's your W-2, your regular employee. The advantage for the company is I'm not paying for a full-time worker that I only need four hours a week Mm -hmm. and may not need at all this week, but I need them three times next week. On the inverse, the advantage when they're an employee is, of course, they're always there. There are tax implications with that as well. With the 1099, if, say, I consult for a company and I'm just there for a a one-off or writing their manual or something, they're going to give me a 1099. I pay all the employer taxes on that. As everyone, if you look at your check, if you can decipher your pay stamp, (laughs) it says that you're paying Social Security and Medicare tax. That's 7.65 total percent. I pay it. It comes out of my check as an employee and the company I work for pays another 7.65. So we're looking at 15% total that goes. As a 1099 person, I'm paying that whole 15%. Mm. So there is a higher tax cost to the independent contractor than there is to the employee, the regular employee. Mm-hmm. So as Great. far as the payments coming in, that's an accounting question. So <laughs> not gonna want to get too far into the financial machinations. Got there. it. Got it. Beautiful. Well, I love a woman who knows where her boundary is. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. that's really important. All right. So a couple things I want to ask you now. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about firing. Because when when I was actually in the real estate business at one point in my career, I was managing like 3000 units and I was the senior vice president of that whole like division in the next state over. And I had to fire people twice. And holy shit, what a nightmare it was. Yeah, One was like she was screaming and crying and throwing Mm -hmm. things and like. It was horrible. It was a horrible emotional experience for me, but it was clear that it was not a fit and she needed to go. And then I fired a guy 
And he refused to give me the keys and refused to be fired. And this was back in the 90s where, sure. <laughs> you know, it was a little bit different. But I had to literally call the owner of the company, who was a man, uh -huh. and have him come down and fire the guy that I had fired. So, Ick. yeah, let's talk about having somebody else do the firing for you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> it is difficult. And I have to have to say that, yes, it's difficult for the person doing the firing, but not as difficult as the person who has to go home that night to their family and doesn't know where the mortgage is going to come from next month. So I want to preface what I'm going to say here as I know I don't have the hard job of that situation. Preparing to fire someone, whether it's a reduction in force due to finances or because they're doing a terrible job, is sleepless nights, you know, upset stomachs. It's because you're preparing, particularly as women, I think we over prepare for every consequence. What if they cry? What if they scream at me? What if they just walk out and don't say anything? What if, you know, there's all these. What if situations. they refuse to be fired <laughs> yeah, or they refuse to be fired, which is like, call the cops, you know, ah. <laughs> which has had to not in my experience, but of course it has had to happen in corporate America, in small town America, every once in a while you have somebody who's, you know, perhaps becomes violent, which is also part of the consideration. You never know what you're going to get when you turn somebody's life upside down. You kind of, I almost, almost want to joke about that, but it's not a joke and it can lead to workplace violence and that sort of thing. So, but Typically, when you are terminating someone, there is typically a reason why that person is the pick. Mm. If you are re reducing forces because of, you know, you're going broke or whatever, then maybe it's a, a wider swath and there's not a specific reason you picked that person. It's just money. Mm. But if you have lost your job for cause, it's because there's cause, you know, you either were coached to do something a certain way and you just never could quite get it. You didn't listen. You didn't show up on time. You, or you, you know. rubbed yourself up against the behind of one of the Gross. ladies in the office. Yes. <laughs> Which is why I fired him. <laughs> yeah. Put that right on top of the list. Even the whole, oh, I just came to rub her shoulders because, you know, she looks so tense. It's like, no, you don't touch people. Don't touch people in the workplace. I mean, if you have somebody who's a hugger and it's their birthday or whatever, okay, you lean in for that, whatever. But if, if well, no. even in that case, I think you ask for consent. Hey, it's your birthday. May I give you a hug? Right. Yeah. Like then, then it's consent, right? Yes, exactly. But yeah, don't, you know, is, is the shoulder okay, but the small of the back is not. No, none of it. Just don't touch. Yeah. There's no reason to touch your coworkers. All right. Keep it, keep it simple. Right. Don't touch them. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty Great. basic. <laughs> Just don't touch them. All right. I did want to talk a little bit about the soft skills just a little bit because, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things you came in with was like, okay, we got to know the laws and the laws of this and the laws of that. And that's, you know, like straight up kind of strategic and intellectual stuff. Mm -hmm. What kind of soft skills do you have to bring to the table? And it seems to me as from what I'm listening to, you got to be pretty balanced between the two. Very much. Very much. You are walking a, a thin gray line. There's not a sharp designation. You work for the organization, but your job is to you know, the care and feeding of your, of the staff, of your employees. And so it becomes kind of a 51%, 49%. You're right there in the middle. Listening and with listening to understand, not just listening to reply is a big one. And just being able to kind of sense even, and this is, I believe why so many human resource professionals are women. There are plenty of men out there as well, but the vast majority, and this isn't a real stat, but I'm just say from my own knowledge, I'd say 80, 20 women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being able to kind of sense somebody and knowing your employees, knowing the people around you to know when something's changed. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, it's the intuition piece, right? <laughs> yeah. And, but yeah. to also have the strength to know that, oh, they're not mad at me. Maybe their dog is sick mm. or their mother is, you know, in the hospital or mm. they got in a fight with their boyfriend last night or whatever the case may be. There is a kind of just sense about the people around you and being out of your office, not just sitting behind your desk all day, but being out, like, it's called leadership by walking around, you know, mm -hmm. getting to know the people, getting to them to see your face. So when there is an issue, they know who you are, they can come to you, you can go to them, because Great. you're already a known entity out there. Yeah. So last minute, we have like a minute left. What are your favorite companies to consult to? Like what industry, what size, where mm -hmm. where people hire you to come in as a consultant? Most of my experience is in smaller businesses. The largest one I've worked for is like 7,000. So it's not that big compared to some of the, you know, Amazons and that sort of thing out there. So I'm going to say small businesses particularly those that don't have an HR person and you as the owner, you're there to work on those cars or, you know, make those widgets or actually be a doctor in your doctor's office or your lawyer's office. Doctors and lawyers turn out to be terrible business people. It turns out. <laughs> yes, they do <laughs> work for a lawyer right now. So, oh, <laughs> so, okay. so yeah, I, I would say the, the small business side, because my knowledge is fairly broad. so And, and I, you can have a good impact. Beautiful. Yes. All right, Julie, it's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for being with me today. Listeners, we do love feedback. Please let us know what you thought of today's episode. Go right now to www.wickedlysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions, or submit guest suggestions. Thanks for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.